Okay, so uh, yeah, I want to talk to follow. Uh, and first up, an apology. So when I put this together, we were looking at Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, I then saw I was following Charles, who in every session I've seen at C Data Cloud has kind of been Mr. Jupyter Notebook. So I extrapolated forward and thought, well, there's stuff there I won't now need to cover. So this is, a da this is an example of the dangers of extrapolation versus interpolation. So uh, I'll put a lot of context, I suppose, around why we're using Jupyter Notebooks. And this, this comes back to, uh, within Ireland, we've now got the, the Harnessing Our Ocean Wealth Policy, government policy uh, around uh, a key element of economic recovery, sustainable growth. And this is around thriving mar mar maritime economy, healthy ecosystems, and engaging with the sea. Now, as Marine Institute is the marine agency within Ireland, um, we have a new strategic direction coming out uh, beginning of December. But as part of that, uh, data is now what's considered a strategic enabler within those focus areas of what we're delivering. So we've looked to put together over the last couple of years a data strategy uh, around a 2020 vision where Irish marine data will underpin the development of Ireland's marine sectors and the sustainable development of Ireland's marine resource. And what you'll see in here is one of those, uh, not quite pillars, but blocks, is around quality. So why is quality important? Uh, taking the data information knowledge policy, uh, building up as a pyramid. So you're seeing collection, organization, aggregation, analysis, and synthesis of data underpinning decision making. Particularly in the area we work, taking an example with wave boys collecting data on wave strength, wave direction, period. We're looking to generate information from those raw data high resolution data to characterize sites which enable marine renewable developers to decide right which devices should we be putting in these sites how do we is there a device that fits the characteristics of these sites do we need to develop one or what do we have that we can tweak and that then ultimately also informs policy where will we site these things where will we, so feeding into marine spatial planning and quite often what we're talking about, when you're turning around data, it can have quite a big impact. So we also work with harmful algal blooms, predictions, and monitoring. If you tell an aquaculture uh, farm, uh, you can't, you've got to throw away all your stock because uh, we've detected a harmful phytoplankton and you're wrong, that's an awful hit to their economy. By the same token, if you don't pick it up and those, that stock makes it into the market, uh, and you, uh, you're seeing shellfish poisoning. Again, there's, there's the acute risks around not having good quality data in a timely fashion. And particularly when you start off with data, maybe there's only a few people involved or impacted by that data in that form. But as you move up the value chain, more people become impacted by it or interested in it. So we need transparency back down the chain. What informed this policy? And by having that transparency, you build trust. But not everyone is always going to understand the transparency of the processes involved. So we want to say, right, what's another way that we can gain this trust around our quality of our, of our data? Uh, and so what we've looked at here is the IODE now offers an accredited NODC status uh, of the 80 plus NODCs and then moving more into the associated data centers. There are only six or seven at the moment that hold this accredited status. And a key part of this is having a quality management framework in place around your data. Uh, by getting the IODE accreditation, you also inherit as an umbrella uh, through the ICSU World Data System accredited, accredited data center. We also have another driver funding through the European Maritime F Fisheries Fund around marine spatial planning, making sure that our data is fit for purpose within that, and that also involves a uh, quality framework. So there's two drivers within that. Uh, effectively, te technical, Data Technical Group created a quality working group, uh, quality framework working group from across a number of different service areas. So this is a kind of a ground up uh, it's the people that are actually handling the data, generating the data, looking at how we're going to implement this framework. We've made, pretty, made sure that corporate data were out of scope on this, so this is environmental data. Uh, then the ID, IODE, we're running a course in September, um, Ostend last year, uh, which we attended uh, around how to put together a quality framework. So these are some of the, the principles, you know, the idea being it's around relationship management, uh, customer focus and engaging people, having clear leadership, but also taking a process approach with regard to continual improvement and then feeding into evidence-based decision-making on those improvements. So it's not like a 100-meter sprint where you get to a finish line, right, we've done this, bang, that's great, woohoo, look at us. It's more like the idea of the Red Queen hypothesis. You're on a treadmill. To stay in the same place, you've got to keep moving forwards.
So the idea of continual improvement. So we've heard talk yesterday about sure, quality assurance, quality control, and sometimes people will use those interchangeably, but there's a bit of a distinction, although they are kind of flip sides of the same coin or leaves on the, within an onion as you peel it back. Quality assurance tends to be more proactive. The aim is preventing defects, and the, the focus in quality assurance is around the process. You're assuring the process that is generating a product or the data. Quality control tends to be reactive afterwards. What slipped through the nets? How do we detect those? And then we, what corrections do we apply if we can? Uh, it doesn't necessarily consider the process that generated the data. Uh, and some work that was done within, I think, one of the IC's working groups, uh, this was provided to me by Dave Stokes, uh, who works at the MI and the Fisheries. It's just a sort of concept of how effective is QA versus QC over time from data generation. And what you see is that the QA is, is deemed to be more effective, uh, closer to data generation, and then the effort you put in later on to QC, it diminishing returns. So that's a bold statement to make uh, with a very generalized graph. So I'll just provide an example, and I will step outside of the uh, marine environment. Uh, car manufacturing. In the early 90s, the studies was done. There's a distinction between Europe and the Far East. And what you found was 17 hours a car in the Far East in terms of production, three times as long in Europe to produce a car. So you think, well, you look at some of their, is, is quality a factor here? Well, 80 odd de defects per 100 vehicles, three times as long to take a car. Hands up, who thinks that by doing a car more quickly, you will end up with more defects? You're either guessing or you're, um, you're seeing where I'm going. In actual fact, the car takes a third of the time to create, but actually has 34, uh, has 50% of the defects. So just extrapolate that now back to the work you do uh, with regards to data. And the reason there is, within the Far East, the process there, all workers on the assembly line were responsible for detecting defects, stopping the process, fixing that defect, and moving on. Thereby, you don't have a backlog of defects to be continually fixing, and you move continual improvement. Within the European car sector, who prided themselves on their QC, there was the classic idea or concept of a bunch of men in white lab coats with a clipboard walking around every car that was produced. Right, no, that needs to go back. That needs to go back. That's not right in that way. So another example, to put some figures on it, Palm Pilots, uh, what they found was they could record people when they were doing the software development. If you found a bug and you left it, they could, because they're assigning time to this, um, it actually took 24 times longer to fix a bug three weeks after finding it and fixing it right there and then. So again, when we look at that, something that could take you five minutes to fix today, if you leave it three weeks, it's going to take you two hours. Half an hour in three weeks' time, effectively two working days by the time you put lunch and breaks in that. And likewise, one day, 20 working days in a month, you're looking at a month's worth of work to fix something that you could have fixed in a day now. Just something to think about. We also took into account what journey our data take. I'm not going to labor the point. We've already seen it's complex. There's duplication. There's, uh, um, and, but what we're looking to do is assess our processes along this idea of plan, do, check, act. You do it, you run it through an iteration, you pick up any issues, and you feed it back through. You're also getting information from uh, stakeholders. So we've generated a manual which follows the ISO standard. Uh, so that's the structure of the manual. Um, I'll fly through these, and you can take a look back later on with the video. Uh, so again, that's structured around the plan, do, check, act. But of course, when you get data scientists involved in something like this, we wanted a process flow to describe the process of generating process flows. So this is a more high-level aspect of this. And what you see here is you've got a number of inputs. You know, you need to assess the standards, the methodologies that are available. What are your institutional policies and strategies? What are the legislative drivers around what you're doing? Uh, what's your data and inf IT infrastructure? Uh, how are your staff trained? What's the resource in order to do this? And what are the management systems in place? Then you see a conceptual idea of the Plan, Do, Check Act. You're looking to get requirements, documents, uh, requirements gathering. <laughs> You need your requirements. How do we know we're meeting success? How do we know we've achieved what we've set out to do? And in that way, you're also allowing performance evaluation. How do you assess that you've, you've met the targets? And then at the other end, what we hope comes out of that is you've got your data product or service. You've got your, your, your governance and compliance. You've assured your process. And then you, you've got reliability around your knowledge uh, and advice. 
We also then put in place uh, a pack to help people as they develop their processes, uh, to assure their processes around data management plans, which you'll all be familiar with. As I've said, requirements, user accepting, testing. How do you know you've hit the target? Uh, then we worked around process flows, uh, and that describes what needs to happen to achieve the objectives. Uh, they're preferable to pages of text. Can describe, that can describe uh, the code that's written to lay it out uh, for troubleshooting, or a higher level process integrating several processes. And this is where we can come in standard operating procedures. Some will just be documents that you rip. Once you've done this, do this. Once you've done this, do this. Um, but we've tried to incorporate, and this is the Jupyter Notebook bit, um, instead of having a, a, a document on the shelf gathering dust, which you take down and you pull bits of snippets of code out, which you cut and paste into MATLAB or cut and paste into SQL and then pull together a document at the end, it gives you a living document that you can go off and run a script. You can interrogate a database. You can pull back all the information you need there. And then at the end, you can save it. And write, this was the run. That, did, that we did to process this cruise, this data on this date. And it's available afterwards as a saved PDF that somebody can come back and, and take a look and see, right, okay, what did we do here? Um, or what was done there? And then being a living document, if you need to change it, you change it as you go, and then it's available for all future iterations. Okay, two minutes. So yeah, as I said, and then there was a performance evaluation template. So those are the additional benefits, as I say. Uh, I'll fly through those. So we've submitted ours for review to get uh, NODC accredited status back in October. Uh, and so we're waiting on that. Um, yeah, so what we also found then was the QMF model when we used it. We started off with a view of quality around our data policy or data strategy. But actually what you find is when you look uh, a little wider, by doing quality assurance rather than quality control, we've actually covered and ticked off a lot more of these boxes. Governance, connectivity, who our users are, what, where is the data going, what are our capabilities, what processes do we have, what supporting tools do we know, need, and which directions are we going in, um, and tying it all back in with the overarching policy, licensing, and governance. So just quickly, where next? Uh, what we noticed was data site have DOIs for, for workflows. So where we, we've got a carrot there for those people, you put together your workflow and actually you can get some credit for it somewhere. Um, and maybe that could feed into the ocean's best practices as well. We can also identify bottlenecks and then provide tools to help people. So just a quick video here. This is just 200 lines of Python using the Boki toolbox. And what we found was we're getting large volume data, sort of every 10 seconds uh, from the cable observatory. And what was happening is the guys, when they come to QC it, they want to, make, they want to know, well, what, what impact is my QC going to have when, when it's binned out to one minute, <coughs> 10 minutes, five minutes? So we've built this interactive tool. The slider just allows people you to see, right, what does the effect of averaging have? There's nice little tools on the toolbox where you can quickly go into a an axis, if you hover over the axes and scroll, you can zoom in, zoom out, uh, rather than just doing it in the center where it does it all evenly. Uh, then you've got a nice lasso select, uh, which enables you to do a nice polygon if you've got a slightly gentler touch than me, uh, and then choose to flag that data. And then once you flag the data, you can go back to the time averaging, and just reset it out to the original set, and then you can take a look through by doing the averaging, right, what's the impact of those data that I've just flagged when somebody comes to bin my data later because they're not going to want 10, 10, second, oh, 10 second resolution, they might want hourly, they might want 10 minutes, they might want five minutes. So it's taking a process that would have been a number of steps or iterative or would have been fed back at some point in the past uh, and, and making it quicker, more efficient. Um, one final thought I just might, thought I'd leave you with. When we looked at the process flows, you know, you've heard working with Adam, uh, we do a lot of work around linked data. When you describe a process, particularly maybe around chemical measurements, chemical samples, biological samples, um, it occurred to us we've been doing some work and looking, trying to decide well, how can we represent those within linked data. If you look at a process flow and take the steps in a process flow and then turn the arrows round, uh, put some provenance information on, what you can quickly find here, the example here being uh, the dissolved inorganic carbon method, um, you can potentially turn a process flow around, build it into linked data. And so we start talking about how then we get procedures or protocols 
into the web. You're enriching, tag, tagging those up or linking those to data within the O&M where there was a bit of a gap around the procedure. Um, you're starting to get into then a sort of semantic model uh, and enriching the metadata around the data that we have. And that is me. So just finally, thanks to Greg and Claudia at IODE for running the QMF course, which I highly recommend. <laughs>